Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Kinlan. Hello. Hello. You are? Carsten Schmidt. Hi. We're here today to talk about uh, DevArt and the work that you're doing with that DevArt project, what the DevArt project is, um, kind of how you can get involved, and how you can start to kind of explore some of the things that you might want to do inside that project. Um, so I think it's probably best to start with an introduction to DevArt and what DevArt is. So DevArt is uh, it's a project by Google with in combination with the Barbican. Uh, where we've commissioned a number of developers to create new digital art, essentially, which will appear um, inside, well, inside the Barbican in a Digital Revolutions exhibition. Um, the really cool thing is that there's actually an extra slot open for a developer uh, through the DevArt project to be commissioned or to be commissioned alongside the three artists that we've got. And one of those artists is Karsten. <laughs> um, one of the things I will say, though, is that one of the, what we're trying to do um, with the DevArt project is take developers and let them explore their creative uh, abilities. Things sometimes, me especially, right, as a developer, I don't normally think I'm that creative. But given some inspiration, I can go and do some really cool things inside, uh, you know, inside the kind of the art space with code uh, and computing technology. And that's what we're trying to do inside the DevArt project. So with that, I will just hand over to Carsten mm -hmm. and let you introduce yourself to our okay. audience and let people know kind of what they might know you for. Who I am. <laughs> OK, I'm Carsten. Um, I'm from East Germany, but been living in London for 15 years now, or 16 years. And I started, when I was 13 years old, writing for six years, roughly, uh, just assembly and hex code on the 8-bit Atari. And I joined the local demo scene, which then became less local and became more Europe-wide. And mm. Then, uh, when I was 18, I wrote a port of Lemmings for the Atari, and then I went, had enough of computers. When you say Atari, do you mean the Atari ST or the Atari? The 8-bit Atari. The 2600? No, the 800XL. Or oh, OK, cool. 130XE, like that whole group of family. Oh, wow, OK, cool. Yep. Um, <laughs> the last 8-bit Atari, really. Oh, wow. My dad used um, to fix Ataris like crazy. Cool. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. That's a side story. Doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> yeah, let's not start with the C64 <laughs> and Atari. Um, and then I had enough of computers, made music for four years, had my own studio. And from that, I really, from my demo scene days, I because I've kind of been thrown in the deep end totally, and I had no idea of programming before or actually what a computer is. So we, we had in our heads no distinction of this is programming, this is making music or chip tunes or yeah. making your own types or icons for tools you needed or making your own big font for scrolling text and all that stuff. So for us, it was really everything related and also everything was achieved through programming because yeah. in the old days, there were no tools really. You had to, if you wanted to do interesting things, you had to write your own stuff. And I think that mentality in hindsight now was really the best school I ever got. Mm -hmm. And it was especially that first year, we had eight months time to do a computer game from scratch. Yeah. None of us knew anything. And it was in insane pressure. We had only one hour computer time a week. <laughs> and everything else happened on paper. And that's why I still have now yeah. most of my work, which is not related to actually typing in code, is still now notebook based really and I yeah. can't see that this how this will change really like yeah the tablets and so I'm trying to compare your notes to the notes that I've made <laughs> um, <laughs> so everyone can't see this on the screen but um, yeah, Carsten's got show it's, it's a very in-depth yeah. kind of notepad <laughs> with a lot of ideas about what he's trying to do inside this this the, like this mm -hmm. dev art project at least um, I don't know whether we're going to get a chance to go through all that sub stuff today. Probably but not. I mean, um, the, we will go through that. You can go to the DevArt website. I will document my project in more detail than I've done so far, because yeah. it's still early days. There's a lot of yeah. moving ground. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the really interesting things about the DevArt project is that the, the site itself um, is powered by GitHub, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well. You know, the, the server is on App Engine and a whole lot of other stuff, but the actual back end itself, where you would normally have like this weird CMS where you actually try and kind of manage projects, is actually done, but done and powered by GitHub. So uh, Carsten's code, 
and kind of all the, the like the blog entries that you're making mm -hmm. are all in this one repository inside GitHub. So you can yeah, go and also to there are three D files in like yeah. I've made some mockups for the exhibit. So these yeah. are all Blender files, for instance. So you yeah, can so find them in there. Yeah, it's like really cool. You can take basically take the code, follow exactly what Carsten's doing, kind of commit by commit by commit, which is really cool. And the other two artists as well, uh, Zach um, Lieberman. Yeah, Zach Lieberman. <laughs> 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 And um, uh, Vivara, I always get the name wrong, Vivara and Mar, oh, yep. um, they're also kind of all got their projects on GitHub as well. And you can kind of just follow along as you go along. And there's the code side of it. And then mm -hmm. there's also kind of the, the assets. The assets, yep. yeah, and the posts. So like there's like mini blog posts all powered by the, like, the Markdown engine that's been built into it as well. So you can kind of follow everything along. It's really nice. Um, and you can just go to the DevArt site if you don't want to go to GitHub uh, and just view all the content from there. Um, so. Probably a lot of people who are watching this know you from kind of the processing scene as well and a couple of other things. Probably. Do you want to kind of, do you want yeah, to kind of so talk about where you went with that? Yeah, so the reason I, I actually stumbled on, or, or across, I came across processing really more or less by accident because I've been doing web development from like 95 to 2005, really. Mm -hmm. and. I've been spending a lot of my time with Director and with Flash, and I really realized that it's a quite scary endeavor to focus your entire livelihood on a single tool. Yep. And so I started looking for options and going back more to my roots and like not use a pre-made tool, but actually start working on my own tool set again. And I came across processing just by looking around for what is their Java-based yep. at the moment. And it was really still young. It was 2003, uh, spring 2003. And I found it super interesting. I just sh shoot uh, an email to Casey and Ben and how I can help. And I did like then end up contributing a few little bits to the graphics engine, but mainly started really using processing for my own work and realized that this is really transforming everything I, I knew, yeah. and if actually everything I wanted to do, but didn't really had uh, the tools to do that beforehand. Yeah. And so it became really a stepping stone in my kind of career. <laughs> but uh, then I also realized that there are a lot of things in processing which are really more or less focused on just the display side and mm -hmm. really aiming for this creative computing field as it was emerging back then. And I was more focused on actually doing something which allows you to solve actual design problems. So where you have, for instance, not where it's, where it's a tool which is not just making it easy to draw objects on screen, but actually work with those objects as abstract entities to do stuff with them. Okay. So for instance, instead of just drawing an ellipse on screen, which you can do in Canvas with one line of code or in processing with one line of code, the computer still has no idea that this is a circle you are just drawing. Mm -hmm. So, and what I started then focusing on is to actually provide a set of tools which allows you to work with geometry initially as entities, which yeah. you can analyze and combine and transform from one into another. And I think that became, I realized how important that is to actually solve real world projects, yeah. you know? and how you can actually combine this with all the other interesting things going on at that time and also now, like say agent-based systems, particle systems, physics. And then it, it just ex uh, uh, exploded from there really in terms of scope. And in 2007, then I took that seriously really and started uh, setting up my own studio or like really my own design practice. It wasn't ever a studio really. <laughs> um, and they are really tried to focus for the first two years to reject any form of project which would not allow that a uh, new open source project to grow. Okay. So I only basically I turned down every work which would c c uh, create some form of repetition. Yeah. And that actually allowed me to work with people I never could work before, with like lighting designers, architects, and th that kind of uh, other part of the design world. And that I still think is the most interesting part of my job today. So yeah. um, I'm always trying to kind of meander between the commercial design world and the more artistic freeform expression, which for me is mainly just research for yeah. future and uh, more pragmatic object uh, projects. So, 
So I suppose like, is it, uh, this is gonna sound stupid, is, is that the, the fun part for you? Or is it, it, is this like? I don't really, I think, oh, it's a hard question. I think what is good when you have a, a client project, and even this is a, essentially a client sure. project, you know, it's only in the art world we call those people patrons versus <laughs> clients. So th I think the, the dynamics are not that actually very different. Um, but I think what always helps is if you have a deadline. It just stops procrastination mm -hmm. and it keeps you focused on achieving results. But I think the kind of process is not very different to how we do a commercial pro yeah. project. No, that's cool. Um, so I know, um, so what kind of what I've understood is talking about now recently, at least anyway, is more on the kind of everything is inside the, like, when we say digital space, like inside mm -hmm. the computer. Uh, how do you see kind of this this kind of work? Well, we're going to show this work in a, a little bit as well. How do you kind of see the like the interaction between, say, software and kind of physical objects and th those type of experiences? Um, well, I, a everyone knows it, and it's all happening all around us. But this convergence of, <laughs> and I really hate the word, but there's no better English well, word for it. Than, really. It's better than synergy. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> point taken. <laughs> um, so, but I think everyone talks about that everything becomes more and more digital and we have more our computing elements in all sorts of objects which we didn't had even five years ago. Yeah. And I think what we don't really realize yet, and a lot of people actually who do more like software research, they actually are becoming more and more aware of it that yeah. Hardware progress is not slowing down, but software progress actually is almost uh, the Moore's law in software is not there anymore. In what because, sense? Uh, because a lot of our algorithms don't actually, they were designed in the 60s, a lot of sure. the key uh, algorithms, and they don't actually tra uh, transpose that easily to a multi-core or fully distributed system. Right. So I think we need a lot more different ways of programming and actually thinking about what code can do and how it actually does it. Yep. And that really means we need to think more about the languages we use in the first place. And that's something which became, in the last three years for me, really the main interest yeah. to figure out, A, because we software technology has progressed so far now that we can design like so-called domain-specific languages mm -hmm. for like say for, I, for this project I will design my own little language yeah. simply because it makes a lot of things easier yeah. but the, the same thing can be um, applied to more bigger uh, aspects as well and if you look at the uh, history of programming languages you can really see how much cross breeding there is going on all the time between yeah. those languages and especially recently we have this kind of Cambrian explosion of languages yeah. Yeah, there are so many coming out, like Mozilla released Rust now, mm -hmm. and this is what they are heavily investing in. Uh, C++ has a new version yeah. after, even though there's not that much um, impact happen, uh, not much change yeah. compared to previous ones. Like, so do you see, um, this is, I don't, I don't know whether this is the right question or not. Um, like these, these languages like Rust, C++, mm -hmm. uh, even Java, like Enclosure, which mm -hmm. I know we, you, we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, they're all very low level, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're designed for programmers, right? When we talk about DSLs, um, do we do we see that, or do you see that going towards more of the consumer space, so people can build their own? Yes, but they are. I mean, it's again, what do you consider programming? That's also one of the things I want to explore in the Dev Art proposal. Is yeah. that what I'm basically proposing is a, a kind of visual form of programming, which is super limited. It only has uh, less than five operators or f less than five words. And that is a that kind of limitation uh, has history has shown us many times has in cool. intense uh, scope for creative exploration because there is not much to understand mm -hmm. in terms of learning vocabulary and people who are interested to achieve a certain idea they will push that available or those available options to their limits yeah. and I think. If we think about more like recent projects like Node Red, IBM's thing, and uh, what's the there's another similar Node-based uh, 
graph kind of visual programming thing which is coming out. I mean, that has a long history which is running pretty much in parallel to the text-based form of programming. But I think those kind of high-level approaches to arranging moving bits of logic into a consumer-friendly way yep. is, is happening more and more. There's also a if then, then that. Yes. Yeah. And that these are all like kind of, you can't call them DSLs, but they are, technically they are. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the start they of automation. They, are, they, they have right. been so repurposed and so much uh, designed and consumerized that yeah. you can't call them a programming language as such, but yeah. there is definitely an element of a language yeah. in there. So you mentioned about the, the idea of like this uh, really constrained kind of language which will help you build your project mm -hmm. or help people who interact with your project build things with it. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit about what your project is for DevArt? Yes, yeah, so the idea of DevArt is, or of my project for DevArt, is that there will be a 3D printer in the exhibit, in the mm -hmm. museum. And that printer will print one object per day. And visitors in the museum will basically take over the role of the curator and choose what object will be printed okay. for the next day. Sure. So there's a running vote. And if an object has been printed, it can't be printed again, mm -hmm. simply to keep the pool open for newcomers. And the other main part, and it's really the, the main part of the project, is a web-based uh, design tool slash exploration tool, which is open to anyone. Yep. Really, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to run on a tablet as well. That's uh, pending hardware. <laughs> Using web consider Yes, of course. It probably will probably be good. Of course, yeah. It will I mean, it'll work, work on an Android tablet. It might not work on like. Yeah, no. The, the thing is, though, uh, <laughs> I think with WebGL is still the the difference between rendering and actually geometry generation. So I think yep. the geometry generation you can do obviously in OpenGL. You can use geometry shaders, and but the there's still a big difference sure. what has to run on the CPU versus yeah. GPU. And, but we have App Engine, we have Compute Cloud available. So yeah. these are the kind of technologies where I'm trying to offload at least parts of the generator yeah. aspect into the cloud. If you have, for instance, just your mobile phone, you can't expect to generate a mesh with half a million vertices. Yeah and kill your battery not in the next 10 minutes. So I have a question. Um, like why would you need half a million vertices? Uh, because that? what I'm after is really to explore how a very simple design process can create a super complex shape yep. or form. And I, I don't want to necessarily restrict what those forms can be. Obviously, the design process and the options will restrict that indirectly. But I don't know yet what yep. the restrictions are. And I think it's a very that's where it goes more into the art world, in my opinion, is that what we are building here, or what I'm proposing to build here, is actually um, an open-ended world, mm -hmm. potentially. And it will be down to the people and the uh, interested parties who will, who will take part in that journey to explore what that is, yeah. actually. And I think this is where you have a big difference to a commercial client project, where the client has a specific aim what needs to be achieved, and here, this is more or less fluid. Cool. Um, so one of the things that we were talking about, this constrained mm -hmm. language, um, so it's the client that is constrained by the, like, can you talk about so like the, yeah, of the client and the server? Yeah, so and, uh, I need to explain a bit more what the design process yeah. is. So <laughs> um, right now, the, the whole project is called uh, Code Factory, but this is really just a working title, yeah. and it, it still is a form of factory what we are talking about, but I think from a there needs to be more reference to my recent thinking, which is all to do with biology and the initial embryonic stages of development. So once you have the egg splitting into the initial ball of cells and then actually forming a fully 3D object from an initial almost uh, flat structure. Mm -hmm. and. So the, the design options I'm exploring right now are simply doing proposing a process which only allows you to subdivide existing uh, structures, to extrude them, or to actually replicate them 
in different uh, di directions. Yeah. And from those three options, there are a few other candidates which I still need to explore technically if this is actually possible. From those three options, you should be able to generate a large number of possibilities. Um, and again, I don't want to limit yet what you can do, but we can look at some examples yeah, here later. So we'll, we're going to switch to the screen. Which, yeah, we switch so now or? So uh, what you see here is basically left hand side my Emacs and the right hand side shows uh, MeshLab, which is a f open source uh, mesh viewer. So and what you see here on the left is basically closure. And is that, that closure with a J? Closure with a J, <laughs> yes. But we will get to that. There's also <laughs> closure with an S. And uh, that is Google's offering, obviously. A lot of you probably will know that. So what this is here using is it's basically, uh, it has not technically so much to do with dev art just yet, but it's using all the meshing tools I've been building for the last few months yep. to actually make all that happen. But we can also start with something simple. So for instance, we have here uh, an axis aligned bounding box, yeah, an AABB, <laughs> that you can look that up on Wikipedia. So that's basically just a cube positioned in 3D space, and we oh. turn this into a mesh, and then we can uh, also smoothen this, but let's just not do it in the beginning. So if I refresh here. So you, you told me earlier about the, was it the Catmull Clark? Was there a, is there a? Yeah, so Catmull Clark is the name of a, s a mesh subdivision algorithm div uh, invented by Ed Catmull, and I forgot this first name of the other person, Clark. I'll do. Sorry, <laughs> but Ed Catmull was one of, or is one of the founders of Pixar, and uh, formerly Industrial Light and Magic. So, and what you can basically do with that, so we have here this simple cube. Yep. And that is obviously very boring, but then we can, for instance, start uh, running this also through the subdivision process, and now it already looks like this. And because this can be applied recursively, so if I reevaluate this, refresh this after two stages, and if you do here, say, for instance, five, then it is a really smooth mesh. Yep. Even though technically you are still only working with a box which is eight points in space, yep. you with a few s simple transformations, you end up with something far more complex. Cool. Um, here's another example where we, for instance, start with a circle, radius 100, and we turn it into a hexagon in this line, and then we extrude that hexagon along the z-axis, and we end up with basically, oops, yeah, something like that. Yep. Boring, <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, besides the point. And then here we can also extrude instead of just a solid, let's go a bit higher up, we extrude actually as a shell, so we basically get now some uh, walls on the side. And we also run this through another subdivision process called do sub in, which is almost the same as Catmull uh, Clark. And now I was too fast. We have to edit that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah, here it was. And oops. <laughs> it needs to be edited, sorry. That's cool. Uh, refresh. So here, then we end up with something like that. So that was still technically, you can see the pentagon very yep. vaguely, one, two, three, yep. four, five. Yep. But it has been smoothed, and we don't actually use all the points for the side walls. So you can very quickly get complex stuff here. We can also remove the bottom and the top. So that means we will only uh, get the side walls now. And I was too fast again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so now we only end up with the side walls. Yeah, oh yeah. But it's actually not connected. So we can, if we want the full shape, uh, then we can, what is, there we go. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. it's not where you can still vaguely see the Pentagon, but. So, and here you basically have those three parameters, again, the radius, number of teeth, and then we define a profile, which is basically the shape of an uh, individual tooth. Mm -hmm. And we can evaluate that as well. 
and that forms then something like this. So nice. and if you see, it's like th three, two lines of code, really. Yeah. You know, and it's it's a super powerful way of thinking about how objects are actually designed. Everything is parametric. Yep. Everything can be replaced by another process. So that 100 might be coming in from some other previous stage, and there is no reason why this couldn't be, for instance, combined with a physics engine, which then actually uh, calculates the rotation of the cogs. Yep. If you would have more than one in a uh, system. Yeah. And uh, the other nice thing is those files are immediately 3D printable. There is no further post-processing needed. So, and, uh, so the reason now, maybe I should talk about why I'm using Clojure for that. Yep. That'd be cool. Which is, so Clojure is a modern dialect of Lisp. And right now, as I'm evaluating this here, this is running on the JVM. So basically, all that code you see on the left is compiled into Java bytecode. And uh, Clojure has, since 2012, if I'm not mistaken, yes, summer 2012, it has a dialect which is called Clojure Script. And that uses the Google Clojure with an S compiler okay. to uh. actually compile into really heavily optimized JavaScript. So that means all that code I'm having here, I actually can compile into JavaScript and run in as well browser. in the browser. Cool. And there's actually there's so much development happening around Clojure Script and the entire tool chain. So it's a super new project, super new language. Two years is nothing. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of momentum happening, and we have, for instance, in a so-called browser REPL, where you can have a browser window open and your normal text editor, yeah. and all the changes you do immediately get pushed into the browser, and you nice. can create your DOM from your normal text editor that's and cool. all manipulate anything. So that's even almost better than JavaScript itself, cool. even though it's using all the technology already existing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, do you see yourself um, kind of? Obviously, we're probably not going to have a cog function. Uh, as no, a, no, as of Dev course, no, no. Like so, as I say, those uh, those functions here, they are for me to explore, not to explore, more test the meshing yeah. thing features because all the meshes itself is basically a graph structure. Yeah. So, and I need to have something which can be verified yeah. technically if right. all the subdivisions actually make sense or the extrusion processes. So having a workflow like this, where I have my 3D preview tied to my editor is, is a perfect way of developing. Yeah. So what's like the next step for you like in this? Because at some point, you're going to have to go to, I, I get this, uh, this is what I'm actually trying to explore myself, is that at some point, you're going to have to go, not to product, but like mm -hmm. to get to the point prototype. where Prototype. Yeah, the prototype yeah. and then like the final implementation. Is, the, is this what you're doing here? Is this going to? Drive that, or is this going to be kind of completely scratched? And then um, so those ex no, the the tool chain is what I'm really working on. I have been yeah. working on for over a year by now. Yeah. So it's actually the fourth iteration. So basically, I maybe have to rewind a little bit. Yeah. So that project I mentioned earlier, which I started in 2007, was called Toxic Lips, and that was basically a library for Java initially, mm -hmm. and it became one of the biggest library packages for processing and mainly has been used with processing, even mm -hmm. though personally I have mainly used it with just Java. But yeah. I, in terms of getting an audience, all the people I wanted to address were from the processing camp. So yeah. it made sense to make it friendly with processing itself. And right now, this is the fourth iteration of a redevelopment of Toxic Clips, but in Clojure. Mm -hmm. Since I really want to target more, the, the uh, want to go back to web development more. Yeah. And actually, the browsers, and especially Chrome, have moved on so much in the last few years where you can do those things now realistically in the browser, not just on 5% of the audience, but it can actually, it's now mainstream, and you can do all those things. And yeah. What I also think there's still a niche because there's a lot of rendering engines and 3D engines for like games mm -hmm. and shader development and like eye candy stuff yeah. for web browsers. But this is more or less, again, from the modeling side to actually 
I'm really highly interested in the digital fabrication yeah. side. So for me, the geometry aspects are far more important yeah. than the actual r representation. That's you know. cool. And you can always piggyback, combine that with 3JS or any of the other frameworks you have. So it doesn't nice. need to be reinvented. <laughs> Um, okay. Cool. So, like, what do you see? Your, like, so this is your. Like, what, what do you see your next step as? So, my this? next step is uh, to really, uh, and I actually made that step already. I just have nothing visually to show yet. Yeah. Is to really work on the operators which you can use to create structures. Yeah. So this is almost tick, <laughs> and that will be checked in over the weekend into okay. the GitHub. Um, I think by the time that this goes out, it'll probably already check in there. Okay, then so it will be already checked in. <laughs> it'll be done. <laughs> check it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the next stage then is to start developing a UI for that because yeah. right now it is a nightmare to actually explore a lot of those options because it is super abstract yeah. to edit those how those processes relate to each other. Yeah. So I think the UI development is what I will focus on for the next two weeks. Yep. And then the stage after that is actually to uh, focus on App Engine and integrate this all with yeah. the different That's modules. Cool. I have a, this is going to sound like another really stupid question. Um, how do you decide when to stop? Like when you're done with these things? When I run out of time. <laughs> is that literally? <laughs> <it>? Literally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm. I mean, as what I said earlier. Like I think deadlines are important to stop procrastination, but for me personally, they also are a hard stop for refactoring. I'm yeah. a manic refactorer, yeah. and uh, like as I said, this is the fourth iteration of the library. I've three previous almost completely developed prototypes are thrown out <laughs> after doing one or two projects with them because I realized that's not what I wanted, okay. and. I also I'm there quite hardcore where I'm not shy to just pull the plug yeah. on something if I don't think that is a innovation yeah. personally. I actually like um so this happens in a lot of communities and um this can sound stupid. I, I, everything I say I think is gonna sound stupid. It does. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um we'll have you on as another guest again for that. <laughs> no, uh, what I was gonna say was like um this whole kind of pulling the plug on uh, on things that don't work, or things that don't work for you at least, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, you yourself, I think you're probably happy with that, but what happens to the people who potentially use your product? That, that, that's another thing why, I, why I'm, especially with this case, it's not really second album syndrome, mm -hmm. but <laughs> it's a little bit. There are like over 70,000 downloads for Toxic Lips, so that's yeah. quite a substantial number. and. I, I know it is being used by a lot of people on a regular basis, and yeah. I realized that, um, how you say, it is very hard to do something which I, per, like, which fits my, you know, sorry, little <laughs> rewind. <laughs> so the, the initial uh, reason for developing Toxic Clips was to actually propel my own work. Mm -hmm. yeah? And it had to fit my own workflow yeah. and my own skill set. and. I only then, once I realized, okay, there's interest by the community, I started then pushing and developing lots of examples, and I did over 20 workshops at universities yeah. worldwide. And a lot of those workshops really have been a huge helpful factor for actually ex developing more examples which help newcomers. Yeah. And what I realized, though, is that a lot of people still lack the more mathematical knowledge. You yeah. know, not everything in this field is related to actual coding. And a lot of the things you can't solve by just copy-pasting. Yeah. And most uh, newcomers really just copy-paste. Like, I, I've been there. <laughs> like, I mean, you, you know the argument. If, if early web browsers wouldn't have had view source, yeah. HTML would have never taken off, yeah. you know, and, and the whole web itself, not to this extent. So I think this is super important copy pasting, but at the same time, you realize that some of the assumptions I made, and especially being a Java-based library, you you always try to fit into the language. Mm -hmm. And now th I even wrote a huge blog post in 2011 or 12, I can't remember now, how I see pr Toxic Lips progressing, and Clojure was part of that equation, but I still hope to have something which is compatible with yeah. the previous version. But 
those languages are almost orthogonal to each other yeah. in terms of approach and in terms of flexibility and what you can do. So why would I want to limit myself now yeah. to do something which works with the previous version? Then I end up with like a MS DOS. Yeah, kind I was going to say it's, it's like yeah, it feels like the, the Microsoft problem. Well, it's yeah, not you like you no, it's legacy 10, problem in general. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think it, uh, this is a small enough project where you can have a clean slate, mm -hmm. and, and you know, even if you believe in semantic versioning, like a lot of developers do these days, every time you have a major version change, that is basically a breaking change. Yeah. You know, or a total reimagining of what has been there before, and I think that's where I am at this stage, yeah. and that's why I've been also taking my time, not to get it right. You can never get it right for everyone, but I think I've done now a lot of projects, three commercial ones, few examples, where I see okay that works yeah. and it's actually understandable. I think even do even you without not yeah. knowing closure yeah, much. No, it's, no, it's you know the what I really love is this kind of maybe you can switch back to the screen, but like in closure you have those kind of uh, arrow operators which yeah. are kind of threading and building pipelines, yeah. almost like in Unix where yeah. you have the pipe. So the the output of one process becomes the input for the next one yeah. and that's so a very nice way of so me just trying to think about your final product. Right? Mm -hmm. So the idea was that you could potentially the, the final piece of art, essentially, or the piece that this, the sculpture that is printed at the end, is just basically a series of pipes of all those different multiple operations. Exactly, boom, boom, and boom, boom. so and then we we talked earlier about this about the, that there's a whole relationship to biology. So and it's not just the cell division aspect; it's also thinking about it from a kind of genetic programming perspective. Mm -hmm. So you have on the one side, you have the uh, visitors in the museum being the curators and kind of the fitness function of this uh, genetic process. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, it's a kind of genetic programming process. And then you have the kind of authors or designers, artists who use the design tool who are actually the population of every generation. Yeah. And there will be this kind of competition between those two camps to decide what will be printed and what is actually popular with the public. And that is on a macro level. On a technical level, all those operators actually form a tree structure. So you can actually then copy and paste different branches from those trees yeah. and recycle Nice. basically DNA sequences or subsections of a DNA for that object. And you can just say, OK, I have already here a half-finished uh, object, but I want to now take that piece of DNA and copy and paste it to this fragment yeah. and see what happens. That's cool. Yep. So we're probably going to kind of start to wrap up now. Yep. There's a lot more I actually want to talk to you about. Um, so we would probably. I'm going to get commitment from you. Would you be able to do another one of these for everyone? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There we are. You heard it. Uh, <laughs> so not um, next week, though. Not next week. No, we'll sort <laughs> it out. We'll wait a couple of weeks. Yeah. It'll be fine. Um, but I suppose one of the things I want to kind of try and get from this as well is um, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are looking at DevArt who mm -hmm. are just like me who who can code pretty well. Uh, we're kind of all very technical, and we want to have uh, a bit of an outlet to try and explore mm -hmm. what we can do creatively with our creativity. Creatively, <laughs> uh, with our code, um, I, if you could give one piece of advice for getting people to start uh, thinking about this or even implementing stuff, what um, would it be? Well, several pieces of advice. Um, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Is one mm -hmm. like m some of the most interesting things I ever developed is by having a bug, <laughs> yeah. which then turned out to be a blessing in disguise. So and also you can't um, approach those projects very much with a fixed mindset that you say, okay, I want to, okay, a little example like I want to create here a cog, that is fine, you know, that's a small step. I can approach it like a normal, well-defined process. But if you just want to think about the power of, say, generative design more, you need to more think about, OK, what are my ingredients without actually knowing what will come out mm -hmm. as a result, and then be surprised. And then it's simply refactoring. And you, you check different variations of parameters, and you let it play. Yeah. And it's this really interactive, iterative, uh, 
yeah. process. <laughs> but uh, it's more iterative in the sense that the process, because you don't know what end, what you will end up with, mm -hmm. actually is guiding your own thinking as well. Yeah. And I really think that you don't have that in other parts of design so much. Yeah. You know. That's cool. So if if there was say you would say one tool, um, say developers don't know really know where to start. Um, would it be processing, for instance? I still think processing is the best uh, gateway truck yep. to that world, yes. Cool. So processing, processing JS, or there's, there's Open different? frameworks as well. I mean, Open again, frameworks. it depends what you do. If you, if you want to do more interactive things which require a lot of, uh, say, real-time, say, video input, computer vision type stuff, or you have intense number pushing going on, I would use Open frameworks, but then again, you are on the language which is C, very low level. Yep. You have a lot of baggage simply from that language level where a framework can only help you that much with. Mm -hmm. If you are simply after quick exploration for idea of ideas yep. without having to learn a really hard language, processing is better or even JavaScript. There are so many. I mean, processing by now, I really don't see as a tool as itself anymore. It is an approach which has yeah. taken over and heavily influenced almost every other tool developed since then in that yep. field. So I think there are so many JavaScript libraries I don't know about. I'll, well I'll, do I'll put a collection of yeah, exactly. them together, and yep. you'll be able to click on them from this video, uh, at least. Uh, I think there's some on the DevArt site as well. Oh, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, yep. that's cool. Um, so yes, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. We're going to have to do another one of these as well, because there's a lot of, like we talked about 3D printing a little bit earlier on before the show. Um, it's really interesting, and I'd like to go into Let's that whole. Like, bring it in the next time. Are you serious? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. We could, we could. I we'll think. see. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you're interested in um, ex like exploring what's possible with DevArt, go to devart.withgoogle.com, uh, or you can click on the link just below when it <laughs> appears. Um, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, you can click on the link, uh, or just follow Carsten as well on Twitter and other social networks that you you might be on. Okay. As well. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.